Well, this is very exciting for me. Richard and I have known each other for quite a long time, but we've never talked in this way. We're usually either telling stories all the time or <laughs> discussing some particular aspect of somebody's recording or somebody's songs. So I know very little, Richard, about your background. So how did your interest in words and music all begin? Well, my parents were musical, although their tastes were perhaps not very sophisticated, whatever that means. But dad used to bring back, when I was about 10, uh, LPs, mono LPs. And I remember them vividly. I remember the, the covers, of course. There was Kurt Wenger conducting um, the Pastoral Symphony. There was Emil Gilles playing the Emperor Concerto, both Beethoven. And then Karl Münchinger with the Stuttgart Chamber Orchestra playing uh, the Bach um, Brandenburg Concerti. But the most extraordinary thing for me as about an 11-year-old was to hear Gili. My father brought this LP back of his recital in 1955 at uh, Carnegie Hall. He hadn't appeared there for the last 16 years. He was lionized. He had to give encores, almost a program's worth of encores. And Decker, I think it was, um, put out this disc, um, a selection of the songs that he sang. And two of the songs in particular made a huge impact. One was Caccini, Amarilli, and the other was Donaudi, O del mio amato ben. So my father and my mother um, were actually very, very um, supportive. I then went to Repton, Repton School in Derbyshire, and started German. And I fell in love with the language immediately. I wasn't terribly good at uh, many of the subjects at school, but this was something new, and I really loved it. And then age 16, 17, I heard on the radio, or was it wireless? Um, did we call it wireless then? I heard Fischer Diskal and Gerald Moore perform uh, Die Schöne Müllerin. You probably remember the, um, the cover of that disc. It's a wonderful mill by Cocho, which is um, actually in the Louvre. And I, when I'm in Paris, I always go and see it. But I couldn't believe that anybody could sing so beautifully and play so beautifully, and that I could actually understand words. And I don't think I learned these poems. They sort of entered me. And by the time I was 18 and went to university, I must have known about 100 poems, very imperfectly. But th they were there inside me because I related them um, to the music. And I've never forgotten them. And it's now more difficult to learn new stuff. But these, these are deep within me somewhere. <laughs> Ich hört ein Bächlein rauschen, wohl aus dem Felsen quell. Hinab zum Tale rauschen, so frisch und wunderhell. Ich weiß nicht, wie mir wurde, nicht wer den Rat mir gab. Ich musste auch hinunter mit meinem Wanderstab. Ich musste auch hinunter mit meinem Wanderstab. Hinunter und immer weiter und immer dem Bach nach. Und immer frischer rauschte und immer heller der Bach. Und immer frischer rauschte und immer heller der Bach. Ist das denn meine Straße? Wo Bächlein sprich, wohin? Wohin sprich, wohin? Du hast mit deinem Rauschen mir ganz berauscht den Sinn. Du hast mit deinem Rauschen mir ganz berauscht den Sinn. Was sag ich denn vom Rauschen? Das kann kein Rauschen sein. Es singen wohl die Nixen tief unten ihren Rhein. Es singen wohl die Nixen tief unten Rein. Lass singen, Gesell, lass rauschen und wandre fröhlich nach. Es gehen ja müden Ränder in jedem klaren Bach. Es gehen ja müden Ränder in jedem klaren Bach. La, 
singen Gesell als Rauschen und wandere fröhlich nach, fröhlich nach, fröhlich nach. And so I then went to university and continued my love affair with Lida. And I felt I might have a voice even. So I rang up <coughs> this singer. I don't think I can tell you her name. I think that would be uh, improper. But I'll tell you where she lived. She 2A Crick Road in Oxford. And I rang up and I said, um, you don't know me, but um, I, uh, I'm very fond of German leader. I wonder whether you could give me a lesson and tell me whether I have a voice. And she said, yes, um, bring a song. So I bought Gute Nacht the first song from Winterreise, rang the bell. She ushered me in and asked me to stand in front of a mirror. I think she wanted to uh, observe my posture as I sang. <clears throat> she started to play the prelude of Gute Nacht, the first song from Winterreise. And she was a very good pianist. And I secretly hoped that we would perform the whole of Winterreise. <laughs> anyway, I then gave what I then thought was the finest performance ever of this great song. Wonderful baritonal sheen, great um, psychological insights. And I was so moved uh, by my own performance that I only looked up um, just before the beginning of the last verse, that wonderful modulation um, to the major. And all I could see as I looked up was her back in the mirror rippling with mirth. And um, that actually taught me a lesson that however bad a student is, you cannot actually um, show, uh, you cannot mock. And anyway, that's what she did. I got to the end of the song, but that was the end of my singing career. And had she not behaved so abominably, I, I might have been up there with you, Ian. Who knows? You know, but this was a great disappointment. Anyway, I then went to Bedell School to start to teach. And whenever Fisher D. Skull um, was singing in London, with Joel Moore to start with, and then Barenboim, I used to hire a bus and used to rush down the A3. And these were wonderful moments. We'd studied the, the um, poems before going, and the students, I think, knew most of them, so they would look at the, 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 the stage. And I think... These were epiphanous moments for me, and I hope the students also. And then I went to Westminster School. And when I was at Westminster, I started my own uh, Liederabend series. Quite simply, I invited those people whose voices I liked. Um, you graced this series, Ian, um, much later on, in about 2005, I think, just before you retired. <clears throat> but we had a whole host of wonderful singers, um, Ian Bostridge, Matthias Goerner, Wolfgang Holzmeier, Robert Hall, he sang Schwanengesang, Simon Kienleside, Felicity Lott, Angelika Kirschlager, and we ended with the person who I think is the greatest leader singer alive by some way, Christophe Brigadien, and he uh, performed Winterreise. Um, these were wonderful concerts because we crowded some 400 people around the Steinway in a semicircle in a very small room. It was a very special atmosphere. And I think the artists liked it very often because it enabled them to run a program that they were going to actually perform elsewhere in a more prestigious venue. But I then started <coughs> teaching through music. I couldn't bear the textbooks, the German textbooks that were available, baby stuff with um, all sorts of stories about the Familie Schmidt, you know, and playing banks and post offices and um, lots of cartoons, and you spent 200 pages getting through the present tense. I think what young people want is to be treated as adults and not to be condescended. So I wrote this book um, called Gefunden, which was... Um, an anthology of German verse and poetry, things that seemed to work in class. And one of the things that they liked best was this aria 
von ähm, Mozart's Die Zauberflöte, ähm, Luises und Osiris. And I'm not sure what recording we've got of this, but um, I think you and I have talked about this before. The, how do you phrase the opening two lines? It, it, it goes, O Isis und Osiris schenket der Weisheit Geist im neuen Paar. So, O Isis und Osiris bestow the spirit of wisdom on the new pair. Well, I don't think you can stop at Schenkert. I think you ought to go, O Isis und Osiris, breathe. Sorry, O Isis und Osiris, Schenkert der Weisheit Geist, and then breathe if you have to. I don't know what you think about this. Well, I was fortunate or unfortunate to be a chorus member in the Klemperer recording of Zauberflöte. And this particular aria was sung by Mr. Gottlob Freak at an incredibly slow tempo. And I don't think it would have been possible to phrase it, as you've just suggested, at that tempo. Yeah, yeah. I know Look, you don't... One, sorry. I know that at one point he picked up the music stand while he was singing this aria. I thought he was going to throw it at the Klemperer because it was obviously so slow. Yeah. But uh, alas, he put it down again. Yeah. Look, I, I don't think breathing has to be grammatical, but here, I, it, it just, it really hurts me if people break after Schenkert. Um, because what are you giving? You are giving Der Weisheit Geist. So that, uh, that, that should come next. But this is a recording, and it's the aria from the Zauberflöte, O Isis und Osiris. Isis und Osiris from Mozart's Die Zauberflöte, conducted by Bernhard Heiting. So, Richard, this obviously got you into opera. Yeah, although opera came second. Um, I think I started listening to opera records age 19, 20, and Verdi was uh, my favorite. I loved Wagner too. They were born in the same year. 1813, and I really can't understand people who like one and not the other. <laughs> I don't think I can do without either of them. But if I had to take one to Desert Island, it would definitely be Verdi. And it's the later operas that are my favorites, particularly Don Carlos, um, Simon Bocanegra, um, Otello, and Falstaff. Um, and I'm chosen for this um, interview I chose the end of Otello. To me, it's one of the most moving things in all opera. You remember the last scene um, in Shakespeare, it, it goes, be not afraid, though you do see me weaponed. He just murdered Desdemona. And this is translated by Boito <clears throat> as Nun mi tema, which is a wonderful translation. It's a subjunctive, let nobody fear me. Um, <clears throat> it's not an aria. It's, it's half recitative and it's half arioso. And the words, which I think <clears throat> you have in front of you, go like this. E tu come sei pallida e stanca e muta e bella. And up to there, you who are so pale, so, t so wearied and so silent is... Um, unaccompanied recitative, and then a bella, you have the strings. It's so simple. It is so magical. Um, and I know nothing, I think, that moves me um, more. And so <clears throat> we hear now this um, extract from Otello, <clears throat> Nun mi tema, sung by Jonas Kaufmann uh, with Antonio Papano and the orchestra of Santa Cecilia.
So that was Nun Mi Tema, the final scene from Veris Otello, sung by Jonas Kaufmann, conducted by Antonio Papano with the orchestra of Santa Cecilia. Can we just talk for a minute before we move on about the actual casting of the part of Otello? Is it not rather a difficult part to cast? It certainly is. Um, you know, it's, it's the distinction between bel canto and can belto. Uh, <laughs> so many people have a stentorian approach to it, which I think completely destroys the poetry. Well, we had a very good library at Clifton, music library, and I learned the opera from the Toscanini recording with Ramon Vinay. Ah. Ramon, Ramon Vinay was virtually a baritone. He certainly wasn't a high tenor. Very interesting. Mm. Yeah. 
And I remember, do you remember when Bergonzi retired from being a tenor, he thought he could, he could still sing Otello. Do you remember? He did a bit of baritone work and then he thought he'd come back again. Yes. And he couldn't manage it. Yeah. And I mean, and, and much, I mean, uh, the passage that um, just heard, that recitative and arioso, is it, not very high. It's... Um, no. But quite difficult to get right. <laughs> quite difficult to get right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lovely. So, Richard, this is now on to Mahler, I think, Gustav Mahler. And I had a very good um, music library, as I was saying earlier, at Clifton. And they had two Mahler recordings there when I was at school. One was a, an appalling performance of the Sixth Symphony and also a better performance but cut of the First Symphony. And in those days, Mahler was not known. Yeah. It's interesting because I, was at, I went to um, secondary school um, in 1959. And for some reason, I heard while I was there and it bowled me over, uh, Kathleen Ferrier singing um, with, uh, with Bruno Walter, uh, both Kindertotenlieder and Das Lied von der Erde. And I fell in love with her voice immediately. I also fell in love with um, her face because on, on the front mm. of these records was this wonderful portrait by Lotte Meitner Graf, who was the mm. Austrian uh, black and white photographer who got out of Austria just in time and had a studio, I think, in Old Bond Street. And she did many of the great musicians. And I thought it was the most wonderful, wonderful portrait. And I loved the voice. Her, her German was not, um, was not perfect, but the voice, it had a directness of utterance that went straight to my heart. And it, it seemed to me completely without artifice, um, so direct, so simple, and unlike some contraltos, like Constant Shacklock, for example, my father took me to uh, see Constant Shacklock when I was about 14. Um, she actually hailed from Nottingham, which is my hometown. Unlike her, um, Kathleen Perry's voice was not plummy. It, 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 um, it didn't have that quality. But I think it was very difficult listening to um, the Kindertotenlieder, which is about death, and the Lied von der Erde, which is about death, particularly in the Abschied, <laughs> to dissociate Ferrier's voice from the tragedy of her death. When you hear that voice singing this repertoire, you, 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 you combine the two somehow. This is not so in her English repertoire. And I think she's actually best there. Um, <clears throat> I remember listening um, to recordings with Phyllis Spur, I think was her, her pianist. And, um, you know, things like the wonderful Frank Bridge, Go Not Happy Day. You can actually hear the smile. It's so fresh and wonderful and straightforward and not arty farty. It's, it's just completely natural. And it won me over. And incidentally, one of my favorite records at home was a 78 of her singing. I can't remember who was conducting um, the wonderful aria from Gluck's um, Orfeo and Eurydice. Um, what is life without thee? What is life uh, when thou art dead? When, when thou art dead. This to me was one of the most wonderful things I'd ever heard. And remained so until I heard Callas sing it in French. But I still love that recording. And I think the translation is so good. What is life without thee? What is life if thou art dead? You know, j'ai perdu mon Eurydice. Well, you know, take your pick. But I think the English is extremely good.
done a lot of, of classes uh, at uh, the Royal Academy and talked to many, many students. On the whole, why is it that Kathleen Ferrier's voice does not appeal to students today? Such a good question. Um, I don't know. I think, you know, when we listen to voices, it, it, it is the most personal thing. Um, much more so than when you listen to instrumentalists, I think. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, is it too, what it means, old-fashioned? I don't mm. find it old-fashioned. I, I find it... But they do. Straight, very interesting. I think, yes, I think they do. Let's go on. Um, I know at this point you suddenly got very interested in Spanish song, which is an area which I never really explored. Well, I think it was in 1982, I decided to write this book on, um, I think it's called The Spanish Song Companion. I did it with a friend and um, Jacqueline Coburn and um, Graham Johnson wrote the notes and the introduction. And quite simply, it annoyed me that nobody in England um, much seemed to be singing Spanish song. Jill Gomez used to, um, and I'm sure there were others, but, uh, and they thought perhaps that the repertoire was not uh, worthwhile. And this is so stupid. The 16th century in particular and the 20th century is as wonderful as anything in the German repertoire or the French repertoire or the Russian repertoire. And so I, I devised this book and translated the poems. Uh, Graham wrote the, 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 the notes. And when I went to the academy in 2006, um, one of my first students was the um, Spanish mezzo-soprano Clara Muriz. And she struck up a duo with, um, um, with Joseph Middleton, who's also at the academy. And although I didn't teach them Spanish, um, because my, basically don't have Spanish, um, I thought this would be an opportunity to, to, to talk about 
how one actually teaches uh, students. I mean, is there a right way of singing a song? Is there a right place to breathe? And to my mind, there simply isn't. And, you know, one goes to so many master classes where the so-called master um, insists that the song should go in a certain way. I think you can breathe wherever you like in song, as long as you make it work. I remember very well a masterclass given by Wolfgang Holzmeier. When I arrived at the Royal Academy, I invited one or two people that I knew. And uh, Wolfgang was on stage, there were about 100 people in the audience, and this rather good baritone was going to sing a song by Brahms, his setting of Theodor Storm's poem, Über die Heide. And for some reason, Wolfgang um, told this singer um, what he thought this song was about and how it should be interpreted. And there was a moment that I'd never forgotten. The baritone said, well, I don't agree. And <laughs> there was this pregnant silence. I thought that Wolfgang was going to explode. He didn't. And he simply said, well, show me. And so this baritone sang the song in a completely different way. And Wolfgang, again, paused, went over to him, patted him on the shoulder and said, sehr schön. And from that moment on, my opinion of um, Wolfgang, which was already high, um, just soared. I think that is the way to take a masterclass, not to insist on how you do it, but to help people do it in their own way. And it's not universally accepted, I think. I mean, I've had horrific experiences I can't mention the singers who were giving the master classes, but who simply give short shrift and they destroy the competence of the singer immediately. I just remark on a remark that I heard Isaac Stern make yes. years ago yes. when he was asked about performance. And he said, of course, there is no right way to play a piece of music. And then he paused very cleverly and said, but by God, there's a heck of a lot of wrong ones. Yeah, that's very good. <laughs> that's and very that's good. Really, yes, you know that's true because you hear something and you just know it's not right. But how, how can you say that there is a right way of performing a song? You listen to 20 different recordings, for example, of Schubert's Litanei auf das Fest aller Seelen, and the tempi are different, the, the, the dynamics are different. There's one very famous German baritone who takes three whole minutes longer than anybody else in the three verse um, version. The musical pulse goes if you take it so slowly. Uh, Fischer Dieskau almost takes it twice as fast. Um, there's no right way, surely. No, what I loved was if somebody came up to you after a recital, after the way you sang some particular song, and you said, thank you very much, but you didn't say, Actually, that's the only way I can do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because you do have to, you have to do things to suit your own technique and voice at that time in your life. Which is why if a song is marked sehr langsam, it's pointless in uh, performing it like that if your technique doesn't allow you to do it. Um, that's right. Anyway, let's move on, shall we? <laughs> um, I think I've never quite understood Berg's music, but you obviously have some real affinity with him. Yes, I mean, I, unlike you, I mean, I'm not a musician, and I really am not. But um, when I first, when I went to university, we studied Georg Büchner, and he was an extraordinary man. He died age 23, by which time he had um, written a wonderful comedy, Leon of Lena, two um, tragedies, Danton's Death and uh, Wozzeck, short story, um, Lenz, that was actually turned into an opera by Wolfgang Riem, which I actually translated later. Uh, but Wozzeck uh, just bowled me over. Um, I think possibly... It was one of the first times in world literature that uh, the main protagonist was a 
uh, a man from the lower classes, exploited, miserable, um, unable to express himself. And Berg was uh, utterly fascinated by it when he first saw it in Vienna in uh, 1914. And he said this about it. It is not only the fate of this poor man, exploited and tormented by all the world, that touches me so, but also the unheard of intensity of mood in each scene. Now, I've chosen the scene in Act 3, Scene 2, where Wozzeck murders his mistress. He loves her, but um, she has been seduced by the, the drum major, and he simply can't um, handle it. Um, and when the murder takes place, you, and you, you hear Marie scream, um, Berg then uh, reprises all the themes that we uh, associate with her. And after the murder, before the next scene, you get the entire orchestra playing this one note in the most extraordinary way. It, 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 it comes twice, and it's just the note B, which is subjected to a crescendo of unbearable intensity. It, it's irresistible. Um, and it's one of, it's almost my favorite opera. Which to, performance and, are we going to hear? Well, uh, it's with Fischer Dieskau and, and Karl Böhm. Du sollst da bleiben, Marie, komm, setz dich. Aber ich muss fort. Oh, bist weit gegangen, Marie. Sollst dir die Füße nicht mehr rumzulaufen. Sie ist still hier und so dumm. Noch Marie, wie lang es jetzt ist, dass wir uns können. Zu Pfingsten drei Jahre. Und was meinst du, wie lang es noch dauert? Ich muss fort. Hörst dich, Marie, und bist doch fromm. <lacht> Und gut und treu. Was du für süße Lippen hast, Marie. In
was Berg's Wozzeck, Act 3, Scene 2, and the orchestral interlude in B with Dietrich Fischer-Dieskau, Evelyn Lear, conducted by Karl Böhm. Um, I used to study this at Westminster because it moved me so much and I thought it was such a seminal work in German literature that and it's also very short. And I always used to show them the film of Werner Herzog, starring Klaus Kinski. And um, <clears throat> in 1993, Nicholas Payne, who was then in charge of Opera North, asked me to translate it for Opera North. And that was my first opera translation. Um, and Deborah Warner's production was one of the greatest productions I've ever seen, either in the Lyric Theatre or the Order Theatre. It was just so stark. Everything that went on stage meant something. Um, contrast the awful production, I think, of Covent Garden, which is so gimmicky and too much going on. Um, but um, I've since translated um, three or four more operas. I did Parsifal with um, Mark Elder and then Lulu in the, in the Richard Jones production. And then for Joan Rogers in Opera North, uh, La Voix Humaine, and then the, the Wolfgang Riem, uh, Jakob Lenz. But it's a fascinating task translating opera. It's not easy. I'll give you two examples. In Parsifal, you recall when, um, when Parsifal shoots the swan and comes on stage, Gurnemans asks him why he did it. And he asks him all sorts of questions. Who's your father? Why do you do this? And to everything that is asked, he says, das weiß ich nicht. So four syllables, four monosyllables, that no, I not. How do you translate that? They're spondies, das weiß ich nicht. I do not know. No one would say that in that, in, in, in that um, context. I know not that, of course, gives opera such a bad name, these, these archaic inversions. I was stuck, and I asked my daughters at breakfast about it because they were learning German, and they said, oh, I don't know. And of course, that had to be a possibility. <laughs> oh, I don't know. But actually, none of these worked. And so what Mark and I decided to do was to change the music. It was recitative anyway, or arioso. I don't know. And it works because it works on stage. It, 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 it's real language. And if it's not real language, um, the audience notices it. So, you know, it's not uh, das weiß ich nicht, four syllables, it's I don't know. But it, it, it was so real, it, it, it was so apt that I don't think anyone noticed. And the other example is also in the first act. Um, they talk about der reine Tor, the, the pure fool. To this wonderful phrase, der reine Tor, the pure fool. Well, you could do pure on a melisma, the pure uh, fool, that doesn't sing, sing very well. Or you could do 
the guileless fool, but no, that doesn't work. It's, it's not simple enough. And this solution eventually I hit on was instead of saying uh, the pure, the purest. So you changed it to a superlative. You've got the extra syllable. And of course, the purest sings beautifully and reaches right at the back of the Colosseum. The purest fool. And so there were things like that. And it's always fascinated me. Um, although I must have to say that I prefer language, uh, I prefer opera in its original language. And I think the way ahead is with surtitles. But that is, um, not everybody agrees. So where do you stand talking about this translation <coughs> business? Where do you stand on something like The Passions of Bach? Have you ever looked at those and thought, how can I, how can I translate this German into reasonable English? I've never tried because I don't think I could do it. Um, and I love the German so much. On the other hand, I think there are a lot of people who don't have German and perhaps who don't perhaps like the sound of it. I mean, that I can't understand, but uh, they don't. And the mm -hmm. story, the narrative is so important that it makes every sense to me to perform it in English, although I don't approve of that. I can understand why that happens. And, and to hear someone like James Gilchrist um, sing, I, I never heard you sing it, but I think it... it it works very well, I think, in English. Yes, it only works insofar that you'll have to change Bach's notes to fit the translation yeah. we all know and love. Yeah. Yeah. But there we are. The next thing was a real surprise for me. We suddenly got somehow to Charles Dumont and Edith Piaf. So you'll have to explain how we've got here. Well, when I taught at Westminster, I mostly taught um, German. Um, but I also taught French because I had to teach French. And my French is not terribly good. I, I love it as much as German. I read it um, fluently. But I've always found it difficult to, um, to speak well. But uh, teach it, I had to. And so I tried to find ways of um, teaching uh, the language through music. And so you could think of lots of things like Berlioz, L'Enfance du Christ, and um, uh, Carmen, and many other things. But what really hit home were these uh, chansons. Of course, they're not called Melodie. That's the art song. The, um, you know, the, the, the songs of uh, Georges Brassens, um, Edith Piaf, uh, Jacques Brel, um, and Charles Trenet, even. Um, these... They're so immediate, the words are so good. And the students had no difficulty at all learning these off, um, off by heart. And um, when I first heard Piaf, <clears throat> I thought, what an astonishing voice. I think all great singers have an unmistakable time. And she just has to sing one phrase, and you know that is Edith Piaf. She also has impeccable diction and the way she colors words. I always recommend that to, to students at the Royal Academy, you could learn a huge amount by listening to someone like Piaf. Um, listen, for example, in this great song, um, how she colors the word mal, evil. She hardens her tone. It's terribly exciting. But there's a very interesting background to this um, song. Um, the composer, and the poet, in other words, Charles Dumont and Michel Vauquer, had arranged to meet Piaf to, this was in 1961, to talk about repertoire. Piaf um, was ill, sent them a telegram saying she couldn't make it. They never got the telegram, thank goodness. They arrived at her apartment, they discussed new songs, including Je ne regrette rien, and the rest is history. And whenever Piaf um, uh, performed this um, in France at the Olympia, uh, there, was a, there was an uproar. People just couldn't believe it. She had to, she had to re re repeat it again and again and again. The audience went wild. I think it's a wonderful song and it's wonderfully performed. 
So let's now hear um, Edith Piaf singing the immortal Je ne regrette rien. So that was Edith Piaf. No, je ne regrette rien. That was um, one thing I did in French. But while on the French theme, I also um, helped Graham Johnson in his wonderful book on um, uh, Gabriel Fauré. He did all the brainy bit um, writing these wonderful um, uh, accounts of the songs and the background. Um, historical background, the literary background, and I translated the texts. Um, and one of my favorites was uh, the Forêt Claire de Lune. What an astonishing song this is, because it, in a sense it's a piano solo, and the voice weaves its arabesque around it. And it's sung on this recording that I've chosen by Gérard Souzet and Jacqueline Bonneau. Um, Suze's voice, before about 1965, you'll know this better than I will, 1975, 1965, was a wonderful instrument. It was open, uh, nothing was forced, nothing was pinched. And th th these times coincided with his work with Jacqueline Bonneau. After about 1965, 1970, he was with Dalton Baldwin, another very fine accompanist, but the voice had changed. And those recordings are simply not as good. You have to be very careful when you listen to these things, which, which, uh, which recordings to buy. I think this is a most wonderful recording. Um, and it's um, sung, I, I can't remember when it was made. Was it made in the 50s? Um, I can't remember. But there's a very interesting... Uh, variant in the Verlaine. In the last verse, which everyone has in front of them, I think, it's um, Au calme clair de lune triste et beau was originally, and one sees why Verlaine changed it, Au, cla au, au, au calme clair de lune de Watteau. So it's Watteau's clair de lune. Does, it sort of sticks out a bit. So he changed it to Au, 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 au calme clair de lune triste et beau instead of de vato. Interesting. Um, perhaps someone should sing de vato one day and see what happens. 
so let us hear um, a performance of uh, Verlaine's Claire de Lune, set by Fauré, uh, with Gérard Suzé baritone and Jacqueline Bonneau piano. That was Claire de Lune, performed by Gérard Suzé and Jacqueline Bonneau. So um, I must say that um, the bits of Kafka I have heard are very, very strange, but they have obviously something in them that appeals to you greatly. So perhaps you could fill us in on what it is about Kafka that you like so much. Well, I first um, got to know him at, at university where I read um, The Trial, The Castle, and metamorphosis. And what astonished me was this nightmare was narrated with such sobriety. It's just so clear, so clean. The vocabulary is so simple. And it was this um, paradox uh, that fascinated me. And also things like metamorphosis. Um, it's actually, in, in a weird way, quite, quite amusing. Um, you get this um, throughout Kafka. So amusement is a way of coping, I think. Um, anyway, it's, um, <clears throat> it was a great success with A-level students because the language is so simple. And again, it's the point of um, feeding students uh, you know, with, with, with adult material instead of um, condescending them with you know, soppy stories. Um, and, you know, it is about loneliness. It's about alienation. And I think we can all um, um, understand that. <clears throat> He's been set to music, too, um, Kafka. There's Philip Glass's opera, which was done in the Limbury studio, Covent Garden, in about 2013, which I went to see, <clears throat> which is wonderful. And there was also a ballet. 
um, sort of fait accompli ballet uh, presentation of Metamorphosis um, that was on the main stage, I think, at, at Covent Garden. Also, songs by Alexander Goer, which I also like. But the one I <coughs> really like is the is Kurtags. Um, they're called uh, Kafka Fragmente, Kafka Fragments. And what he's done, what Kurtag has done, is to take little snippets, often no longer than a minute, from the uh, novels, from the stories, from the letters, and from the aphorisms, and set it to this remarkably original music for violin and soprano. I'm very fond of them. Um, there are 40 very short pieces, um, often, as I said, uh, taking less than 60 seconds. I've actually translated the trial and metamorphosis, and I enjoyed doing it. And then with my daughter, Hannah, I translated, we did it together, of Kafka's Brief and den Vater, the letter to his father, 80 pages that he wrote to his father. It's about his education, it's about his upbringing, and it's about his fear of his father. And again, you get this blend of comedy and nightmare narrated with such sobriety. It's, it's wonderful. Did you meet Kurtak? No, it hadn't. Nor, okay. uh, nor, uh, nor do I do, uh, know much of his music, but um, I know some of the piano solo music. But the, the, these I really love. He came to the Academy. Oh, did he? Yes. And it was very funny because he came in and every time his music was played, he sat there happily. And every time somebody else's music was played, he left the hall. <laughs> 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 I just remember um, Phyllis Bryn Julson, a wonderful soprano with perfect pitch, you know, the ones who can sing anything at sight, coming on the stage on a motorbike, singing an unaccompanied piece of quarter, which was most oh, really? effective. Yes. Well, this is a big change now because we're moving from uh, Kafka to Bach. And I think Bach probably plays a huge part in your life. Well, it did. I mean, I wrote this book. I, well, well, not wrote. I translated all the cantatas in uh, 2000 to coincide with John Elliot Gardner's um, uh, Bach cantata pilgrimage. And I did it because I felt the singers had problems uh, with the language, particularly in the secular cantatas. There are some lines that are really difficult to construe and let alone uh, translate. But it's something I really enjoyed. Um, Bach, I, I mean, I'm not a religious person in any orthodox sense, but Bach has given me more spiritual uplift than almost any other composer. And I grew up with the performances of the Passions and the Cantatas with Carla Richter, um, with soloists like Fischer Dieskau, Peter Schreier, Edith Martis, um, Anna Reynolds. And I simply cannot understand people who say that this is inauthentic. Um, I can understand that Bach would not have performed it like this, but it seems to me it's utterly authentic in the way that it renders the spirituality of the music. And although I like authentic um, performances of Bach, very much pared down, I do like that. Um, I don't, I, I just think that the pursuit of authenticity is doomed. Although you might think that you can perform something authentically, you certainly can't hear it authentically. Because, you know, between Bach's time and ours, we've had Wagnerian chromaticism. So you don't hear it in the same way. And I just wish people would stop saying these things, that it's not authentic, it's not, it, 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 it's, it's, it's not proper, you shouldn't do it. I don't understand it. I, to me, it's wonderful music making. I well, I don't it. understand. I don't understand the word authentic. It doesn't seem right to me. 
Because yeah. we can't we can't do it like Bach did it. Although people often say they are, but you can't. And also we can't I mean just think of Bach's life. A religious man like him, more music pouring out of him and yet complaining bitterly the entire time about the performances, never yeah. satisfied, writing this incredibly difficult music for, for, for young singers. Yeah. I mean, you know, no wonder we find it difficult. And you talked about the rest, it's the restatives I found so hard with the German, often. They are very difficult to understand sometimes. All your uh, recitatives in uh, John Elliot Gardner's uh, performance, there's one uh, performance of a recitative by Bernardo Fink. It comes from Christian Etze Diesen Tag, which is BWV 63, O Seliger Tag, which to my ears is one of the greatest pieces of singing on record. Um, she understands. Yes, I played it because you. Yeah. The, 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 you the it, yes. And it's wonderful shading of text, a completely unforced. It's astonishing singing. And it just makes one realize that Bach's recitatives, the music is as great there as the recitatives in Mozart's operas. They, it's recitative is as wonderful as anything, or can be. I agree. I've chosen the first chorale movement of the um, BWV 140, Wachet Auf. Um, I find it so uplifting for one, and it's been a family tradition here in Highgate always to play this music every Christmas morning. And so here you have a performance of it. I find it quite fast, but I find it exhilarating and uplifting.
That was Zion Hurt, Die Rechte Singen, from Wachet Auf, that's BWV 140, John Elliott Gardner and the Monteverdi Choir. Let's move on to the Book of Leader, Richard. Yes, well, I produced this in, I think it was 2005, uh, published by Faber, um, a selection of, I don't know, some 800 songs with introductions to the composers and, and, and the poets. Um, I just selected two songs from it, one by Brahms and one by, um, uh, sung by um, Ingab Siefried, uh, the piano with uh, Eric Berber, and then Fischer Dieska and Joan Moore uh, performing the second of Schubert's Wanderers Nachtlieder. Um, da Unten im Tale is one of my favorite songs. This might seem odd because it's not Brahms, it's a tune that Brahms didn't write, but he arranged it in 1894, shortly before his death. Um, it's part of the 49 German folk songs. Which are not folk songs. They're, they're, a lot of them are, are not folk songs. And, and what he does to these tunes is extraordinary. Um, I mean, you can get recordings of this that, that, are, that are sort of folksy. They're not arty. It's not art song. It's just, it's just basically all the same. What she does is she varies each strophe. The, 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 uh, just very quickly take you through the four strophe. The boy starts, and you will hear on the recording, he, he says, um, down there in the valley, the river runs so sadly, and I can't tell you how much I love you. The girl then replies in a completely different tone. You're always banging on about love. You're always talking about fidelity. But I know that you are sleeping with other women. That's the gist of it. A bissel of Falschheit is auch wohl dabei. A little falseness is there. He then plays his emotional blackmail card. And he says, look, if I tell you 10 times that I love you and you don't understand, muss ich halt weitergehen. I shall be off. You play it my way. What then happens is the piano ritonello slows and she finds in the final verse this white vibratoless tone. And she says, for the time that you love me, I thank you, and I wish you better elsewhere. It's mm -hmm. heartbreaking. And it's, it's not just in the music, it's, it's in the way it's interpreted. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the shape of it. It's the imagination. It's the color. It's the risks she takes, both musical and emotional. And I think singers who don't do this, even though they have stonking voices, it's as nothing. So let us hear Irmgar Seyfried and Eric Werber perform Brahms's Da Unten im Tale. Da unten im Tale läuft's Wasser so trüb und ich kann dir's nicht sagen, ich hab die so That was 
Wir haben gerade Seefried und Eric Werber performing uh, Da unten im Tale bei Johannes Brahms. The other song is Fischer Diskal at the height of his powers. For me, he was a sort of god. I couldn't, I, I, I don't know whether people who don't have German, I, I don't know whether they, we, they get him as much as somebody who does, but his diction is extraordinary. You, I mean, for example, if you listen to his recording of Tannhäuser in act three, in Wolfram he is, the way he, he says Elisabeth, it's electric. And so it is um, in so many of these leader. And the Wanderers Nachtlied too was written by Goethe on the wall of the hunting lodge um, on the mountains um, outside Weimar, the Gickelhahn. He wrote it apparently ungestated. It just came out and he wrote it in pencil. It was since since um, uh, destroyed, it was burned down. On one level, it's a beautiful nature poem. Above all the mountains is peace. In all the treetops, you can hardly hear a breath of wind. Uh, the birds are silent in the wood. Just wait, soon you too will be at rest. But if you look at it, it's an extraordinary depiction of, of transience. You, you start with huge concepts of mountains that are insentient. You then come down to the trees. They are more living. And in the trees are the birds. They are even more living. And then you come to human beings. And the final phrase, warte nur, balde ruest du auch. Just wait, soon you too will be at rest. It's a memento mori. You're going to die. And his breath control and Moore's playing at the piano part is extraordinary. All these different colors and they are so together. So these are two of my favorite recordings of song, of German song. That was Fischer Dieskau and Moore performing Wanderes Nachli by Franz Schubert. We must have very similar tastes. <laughs> because Seyfried and Fischer Dieskau were two of my 
gods. We were lucky to hear Seyfried on a number of occasions uh, live. You probably did too at the festival hall. Yes, I did. Um, we noticed uh, from 56 through to the early 60s a slight falling away of her voice, which was very, very sad. Vishadiska at the same time, also at the festival hall, was in his element at this time. Absolute God he was. And he was the most amazing inspiration for me. He and Suze were my two big inspirations. And I didn't know the languages, either French, well, I'd done French at school, never did German at school. And yet not knowing the language, I was just moved so much by their performances. It, it's, uh, and, both of them, it, it's sort of visceral. It goes straight. It, yes. It, it, it's an incision. Um, and we yes. hear, we, we, we all hear voices differently, but that's what it does to me. And although you say that Siegfried's voice was in decline, I think the recording of Da Unten Thale was, you know, early 60s. It's what she can do with her imagination that is extraordinary. I mean, the voice is still partly there, but, you know, you can have the most wonderful voice in the world with peerless diction and pronunciation and be so boring. It, it, it's that's... not... It's not Richard, just that, that is the unforgivable sin, Richard, being boring. That is the one thing you must never be. Uh, you could think of singers, and I'm not going to mention them, who have stonking, wonderful voices and, and wonderful technique, and they never move you because they don't do things with text. And I'm not interested. True. I'm just um, not interested, really. Um, but it's a very personal this thing. Is why, but this is why Prigardien is so good, because of his use of the text. Because he doesn't have a great voice, but he's a wonderful interpreter. But I think his voice is a very good voice, but it's, it's not that that moves me. No, it's a, no, it's it's a good it, voice, but it's not a great voice. Yeah, it's his emotional intelligence and the subtlety of inflections. It's, mm -hmm. I don't know how he does it, because it's never at the expense of the vocal line. That's right. So from German song, we're going to move to that rather tricky area, English song. Well, I wrote the, the Penguin Book of English Song. I think it was published in, in 2016, because I, I was so irritated but by people saying that English song is not on a par with French song or Russian song or Spanish song or German song. Uh, it's just simply wrong. It's, it, it's, uh, it's actually wonderful. Um, I mean, particularly um, in, in, in certain decades. But this book is, um, I've subtitled it, um, Seven Centuries of Poetry from Chaucer to Auden. And so there are a hundred chapters hundred poets are represented and I introduce the, um, the reader to the, um, to the poet and then the composer's reaction to the poet and then um, uh, um, print the poem and there are lots and lots of footnotes on complexities of the poem. Um, I, I just think that a lot of singers and pianists don't have the time to research song. They're so busy, and, and one understands why they don't. And so this was written really um, to help in, 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 in that way. And I so enjoyed um, doing it. And there must be about 800, 900 um, poems in it. Um, I've chosen, and I hope you're not going to be embarrassed, Ian, uh, your recording of, um, of, of Quilter's setting of Edmund Waller's um, Go Lovely Rose. Um, I think it was recorded in, in the 70s, early 70s. And I have to say that whenever mm -hmm. your, your recordings came out, I rushed out to buy them because it seemed to me that, that you embodied what I was looking for in a singer. It was, it, it's not just voice, but it's text and it's the combination of the two. 
And this lovely poem, I don't think a lot of people know this. Um, again, it's an example of, of, of what background information, how, how background information can help. It was actually written in the 1630s when he was wooing very unsuccessfully the 18-year-old Lady Dorothy Sidney. And if you know that, the opening words, tell her that wastes her time and me, it takes on an added meaning. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the way you and Jennifer do this, it's, it's wonderful. I particularly like the end of it, which is marked um, pianissimo and contenerezza, so with great tenderness. It's the writ that so moves me. The words are that are so wondrous, sweet, and fair. I might just ask you how, how you can analyze the grammar there. How do you read that? I've had great arguments with people about it because some people want it to be three things, wondrous, sweet, and fair. But I've always thought wondrous goes with sweet, wondrous, sweet, and fair. Yes, so it was an adjective. So it was um, an adjective and not an adverb. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, but uh, one thing, uh, when we listen to this, um, I love the way that that you um, you introduce a rest at the end. Um, one just sweet. You need to, most singers don't. They want right. to show their their breath control, and they go that are so wondrous, sweet, and fair. And that's grammatical. Why have a pause? It's ungrammatical. It's bad singing, people might say. But it isn't. There's often an emotional gain of pausing. And it means here, at wondrous, sweet, you can muster all your emotion and put it all into that last held note. And I think it's magical. And I wish more singers would do it instead of showing off that they can do the whole phrase in one breath. Doesn't this bring us to the absolute nub of singing songs? Not just English songs, but songs generally. And that's rubato. And of course, rubato doesn't mean the same thing to every person. And some people don't like it. If you, if you listen to five performances of a Chopin nocturne, you'll probably like two of them, and you might dislike the other three because of the use of rubato. Um, for me, it's so boring when people sing English song without that sort of feel for how Quilter is a great example, how obviously I feel that Quilter feels about the line. And also, um, and you know this too, that people don't use the consonants correctly. They don't join the consonants properly to the vowels and make them still part of a line. But there, there we are. Yeah. That's my lesson for the day. So, Good. this is um, Ian and Jennifer Partridge performing uh, Quilter's Go Lovely Rose.
That was um, uh, Ian and Jennifer Partridge performing Roger Quilter's Go Lovely Rose. Now, I think you've just been reading Helmut Deutsch's book. Perhaps you've been translating it, have you? Well, I came across it um, when I was teaching in Baden outside uh, Vienna um, last summer. It's called Gesang auf Hindentragen in, in German. It's untranslatable, so I translated it as Memoirs of an Accompanist. And I think it's a wonderful book. And I think all students of song ought to have a copy. It, it, it talks not just about the, the duo partners he's had, um, Olaf Baer, Peter Schreier, Thomas Kvastroff, Juliana Banze, Henschel, uh, Jonas Kaufmann, Brigitte Fassbender, Hermann Prey, Gottlieb Basch, Seefried, um, Streich, Bonny, uh, Kirschlager, Bumbry, Goerner, Damrau, and more. Fascinating what he says about these um, duos. And by the way, the book is, is supremely unhagiographical. He really calls a spade a spade. And he says some not very um, uh, pleasant things about some of the singers, but he's honest. But it's also interesting for the chapters on rehearsing, on teaching, on preparation for a concert, on pianos, on tuning pianos, hilarious um, um, chapter on page turners, uh, on programs, on the press, uh, and the future of the leader Arbent. And it's very uh, wittily uh, written and very elegantly written. And I, I love doing it. It's published by Kahn and Averill. And um, I've really enjoyed a book so much. Uh, but what I want to, um, I want to play Mendelssohn's um, On Wings of Song, Auf Flügeln des Gesanges, because he writes this. He taught a lot in Japan. And he, one of the girls in the class was a young Japanese woman. And he writes this. There was one impression from the first rehearsal that I shall never forget. The song was Mendelssohn's Auf Flügeln des Gesanges, which ends und träumen seligen Traum and dream a blissful dream. One of the younger girls in the middle of the front row closed her eyes whenever she sang seligen with an expression on her face that one rarely encounters from singers in conservatoires. I say again and again to, to students um, that your face, your gestures, they have to mirror the emotion of the poem. It's no good just standing there. Of course, you can overdo it. But to me, it is so important. This word zelig, bless, uh, blessed, is such a gift for a singer to sing. You don't have to close your eyes, but you have to do something. Do you realize as a a wordsmith, how difficult this song is. We always think it's easy because it's so well known, yep. but actually it's, it's not easy at all. <laughs> and it's also riddled with irony. Um, it's, yes. <laughs> but that's another question. It's not the romantic effusion. I mean, Heiner is a cynic. And mm -hmm. I mean, Mendelssohn's um, arpeggios, I mean, I, I don't think it's purely romantic. But you know, um, people in terms. We have to go with the composer. We have to go with the composer, Richard. Yes, of course. But you've got. You listen the to Fisher Nisgal sing um, uh, um, um, the um, um, die, die Feilchen kichern und kosen. The violets giggle and mm -hmm. caress one another. He he sings in, a, in, in such a way mm. that you realise that it's it's self mockery. And the, the Frommen Klugen okay. Kessel. 
And I mean, the poem, the rhyme of Ganges, Ganges, with the genitive of the word for song, Gesanges, is worthy of Ogden Nash. But of course, you have to sing it beautifully. Right. That's why it's so, that's why it's so difficult. Okay. This is Dietrich Fischer-Dieskar and Wolfgang Savalisch singing what we know is on wings of song, aus Flügeln des Gesangs. That was uh, Fischer Diskal and Zavalisch performing Mendelssohn's Auf Flügeln des Gesanges, a setting of a poem by Heine. And after Mendelssohn's lovely, attractive, easy to listen to music, we come to Hugo Wolf, which seems to produce different reactions from people who hear it. Well, to me, he's, he's up there on Parnassus. He and Schubert are perhaps the greatest in my estimation. Um, I, I, I've written this book, um, which will appear in, um, in August, uh, because I, um, audiences still find Wolf difficult. And I wanted to help popularize his music. Um, they love songs like Verborgenheit, like Der Gärtner, like Elfenlied, and like Fußreise, because of the tunes. They're incredibly tuneful. These were the songs that first took off here in England um, in the early 20th century. Um, 
And these were the songs that Wolf came to, not loathe, but he objected violently uh, when singers would only um, perform these melodic songs. His greater songs are different. Look, it's possible to perform Schubert without words. Uh, it would be very pleasant. Um, or as vocalese, or with an instrumental obligato. Um, I mean, think of all of Liszt's wonderful arrangements of the songs, not just from Winterreise and Schönemüllerin, but Auf Flügen, Auf dem Wasser zu singen. It's very cantabile. Of course, the meaning would go out of the window, but it would still be pleasant. It, on the whole, it is not possible with Wolf. His greatest songs are more, Wagner, <coughs> are more Wagnerian in the sense that the, the piano, which is the main part, as he wrote in a letter to a friend, it weaves its way in and out of the vocal line. Um, it's not easy to, um, to sing the melody, to go away with it. But that doesn't mean to say it's not a great song. Ernest Newman was very interesting when he wrote his book on um, Wolf in as early as uh, 1907, four years after um, Wolf's death. He says... The vocal music of Wagner and Wolf is unvocal only for those who cannot understand it. They do not understand it because, whatever their musical culture may be, they are deficient in poetic culture. They can sing, but they cannot think. They are musical instruments, not human beings. Well, that's rather tough. Put more gently, I would say that you cannot really get to grips with these great songs without a very close identification with text. And it's interesting that uh, amongst all the great leader composers, it was Wolf who set great poetry in bulk. You've got Eichendorf, you've got Mörike, you've got Heine, and of course you've got Goethe. Um, <clears throat> to me, he's, he is one of the... Um, greatest of all leader composers. And if you sing, for example, the Mignon songs or the Harper songs, they are so different from Schubert's, but by the time you finish singing them, you are drenched, you are drained. It's like you've been through a mangle. They are so intense and so beautiful in that way. On a more practical note, this, this book that I've uh, written is going to be launched at... Uh, Wigmore Hall on the 2nd of October if we're back by then which I sincerely hope we will be and I've asked Christophe Rigardien Florian Bush Julia Kleiter who is Christ um, Christophe's niece and two um, um, students who have recently left the Royal Academy of Music um, Olivia Warburton and Kieran Carroll names to watch and John Gilhooley has um, um, agreed that this should be so following the initiative of Barbara Hannigan in the momentum um, idea where young artists share the platform with internationally famous artists. So <clears throat> if anybody can remember that date and would like to be there, um, you'd be very welcome. Let us hear Fischer Dieskau and Joan Moore perform Hugo Wolf's Abschied. Unangeklopft ein Herr tritt abends bei mir ein. Ich habe die Ehre, ihr Rezensit zu sein. Sofort nimmt er das Licht in die Hand. Er sieht lang meinen Schatten an der Wand. Rückt nah und fern. Nun, lieber junger Mann, sehen Sie doch gefälligst mal Ihre Nase so von der Seite an. Sie geben zu, dass das ein Auswuchs ist. Das Allwetter, gewiss, ein Hase. Ich dachte nicht, all mein Lebtage nicht, dass ich so eine Weltnase fährt im Gesicht. Thank you. 
Der Mann sprach noch Verschiedenes hin und her. Ich weiß auf meine Ehre nicht mehr. Meinte vielleicht, ich sollt ihm beichten. Zuletzt stand er auf, ich tat ihm leuchten. Geh ich ihm ganz froh gesinnt. Einen kleinen Tritt nur so von hinten aufs Gesäße mit. Alle Hagen hat das ein Gerumpe, ein Gepurze, ein Gehumpe. Abschied performed by Tiefi Schwischediska and Gerald Moore. Um, I think that we have to say a very good um, word here for Walter Legg, because but for him, I think Wolf's songs would be even less known. <laughs> uh, he was very brave to record the ones that he did. And I've never got over uh, John McCormack making a really extremely good effort of one of the most difficult of all. Boss, Ganymede. Ganymede. I mean, at a time when I would have thought practically nobody else would have even attempted the song. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite amazing, even though his Irish accent is so, is so very strong. And, and it was Walter Legg who did a lot of the research for Frank Walker's uh, great uh, biography. Yes. They, they started writing it together. I, I, I explain that in the book. Um, no, I agree with you. We owe him a huge debt. Yes. Okay. So it's your time for your poem. I just want to end, um, and thank you so much for inviting me, Putney Music. I want to end with a poem of Alfred Brendel's. Um, we translated his poems together. Um, uh, they were published by Fiden a while ago. And it was great fun doing it with him. He wrote these poems on long plane journeys, um, often to Japan, and they sort of spilled out of him. Uh, they're zany, they are irreverent, and they're very funny, some of them. Um, sometimes he would start translating them into English. We would then um, meet, argue, laugh, and um, they're not so much translations as versions. One of my favorites is The Coffers of Cologne. The Coffers of Cologne have joined forces with the Cologne Clappers and established the Cough and Clap Society, a non-profit making organization whose aim it is to guarantee each concert goer's right to cough and applaud. Attempts by unfeeling artists or impresarios to question such privileges have led to a Coffers and Clappers initiative. Members are required to applaud immediately after sublime coders and cough distinctly during expressive silences. Distinct coughing is of paramount importance. To stifle or muffle it, forbidden on pain of expulsion. Coffers of outstanding tenacity are awarded the coughing Rhine maiden, the handsome, if slightly baroque appendage to be worn around the neck. The CNC's recent merger with the New York Sneezers and the London Whistlers raises high hopes for Cologne's musical future. Thank you very much and thank you, Ian. Richard, it's been lovely. Thank you very much. Full of uh, interesting and uh, quite deep thoughts. 
which I think people will appreciate. 